for the word of God. That's okay. And God working through Lily, that was great. My mom um, is here, so I got to be careful what I say. But, um, <laughs> but she is a huge encourager of mine. So many times in my life, she would just say to me, I just want you to be happy. And if you have children, you know what that's like. You've probably said to your children a number of times, I just want you to be happy, right? And if we have friends, right, we care about, we say, I just want you to be happy. But when do we typically make that statement, I just want you to be happy? It's usually in, res in response to some decision that a person's made. They make that decision and we say, hey, I just want you to be happy, right? Sometimes it's not the best decision, but we just want them to be happy. Now, probably the most impactful time that statement was ever given to me was when I was in my grandparents' screen porch. My family had uh, a business for three generations, and um, I would have been the fourth generation. But I wanted to be a CPA. I wanted to go to college. I didn't want to uh, be involved in the family's business. So a lot of pressure, right? And so I met with my grandparents. I met in their screen house, and I, I told them what I was planning to do. And my grandfather smiled, and he looked at me, and he said, I just want you to be happy. It was a tense moment, and I'm sure at some levels, my grandparents were sad at this business that you know, they had and, and, and my, my great-grandfather had would no longer uh, be passed on uh, in the family. But ultimately, my joy in choosing that path surpassed for them any sadness that they had. What gave me joy gave them joy because they loved me. And that's what's always behind the statement, I just want you to be happy. Sadly for me, what I thought would make me happy in that career didn't make me happy for long. All the things I was chasing after, more money, you know, to, to be the first person in my family to go to college, all these things, right? It was, it, it was elusive. Happiness was elusive as much as I chased after it. And most of my life, happiness was elusive until I found where lasting joy comes from where I found a, a joy that wasn't just for a little time and then runs out. No, I found a lasting joy. And the source of the only joy that lasts, the, the joy that only satisfies each and every one of us is found in this morning's Easter passage. If you just want to be happy and have it last, if you're looking for lasting joy, then Jesus has the solution for you in John's Gospel. It's John's Gospel chapter 16, verses 16 through 24, if you have a Bible with you. If you don't, we have some Bibles in front of you. It's page 849 in the regular Bibles and page 1072 in the thicker large print Bibles. And Austin's going to bring it up for us on the screen as well so you can follow along as I read it. These are the words of Jesus. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. Some of the disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does it mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me and again, a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is living and active. Your spirit will ensure that it achieves its intended consequence in, in every single heart this morning, including mine. God, use your word to bring us an all-satisfying, never-waning joy that overcomes all our present sorrows. 
overcomes all our present setbacks, overcomes all our present anxiety. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, I know it's Easter, okay? I know this is Resurrection Sunday. I know I'm supposed to pick a passage that, I mean, is about Jesus' resurrection. But, but I promise you, this really is a passage about Jesus' resurrection. It, because Easter is so much more than about an empty tomb. Right? You've got to get to what the resurrection does. You've got to get to what the resurrection is for. You've got to get past the empty tomb to what the resurrection means and what it means for you and what it tells us. And what it tells us, according to Jesus, is that joy is elusive without him. Joy is elusive without Jesus. That's the ultimate outcome of Jesus' rec- uh, resurrection, a joy, a joy like no other you'll ever find. And Jesus in our passage shows us four incredible aspects of resurrection joy. First, Jesus shows us how it's a transformational joy, a transformational joy. It's just hours now, as, as Jesus is telling his disciples this, hours before he's going to go to the cross, it appears in the, in the chronology, hours before he's going to be betrayed, hours before he's going to be arrested, and, and hours before he's going to be crucified on a cross the next day. And to prepare, Jesus tells his disciples, verse 16, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. Right? He's telling him that, that when he's crucified and buried, they're not going to see him anymore for a little while. But a little while after that, they're going to see him again. He's telling, him, telling them that his death, he's telling them that his burial is not going to be the last time they see him. Right? It isn't the end. He says, verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy, Jesus tells them. When Jesus is arrested, when Jesus is, is, is mocked, when he's tortured, when he's falsely accused, when he's, when he's crucified, when he's left hanging until he dies, he's telling them they're going to weep. They're going to lament. Well, of course they are. Right? They're going to be filled with sorrow. But when they see Jesus again, when they see him again in a little while, that sorrow is going to turn to joy. Jesus is saying that joy is inevitable. Joy is inevitable in him. Why? Because the resurrection is inevitable. It had to happen. The cross would lead to a resurrection, and that resurrection would lead to his disciples' joy. Before the resurrection, Jesus' death seemed like a total tragedy. It was meaningless to the disciples because they didn't understand the purpose of the cross. They didn't know that it was to satisfy their indebtedness to God. They didn't know that Jesus was going to be offering himself in their place, in our place, to pay for all the ways that we've shunned God's authority over our lives. You see, Jesus gave himself to pay for our literal rebellion against God for all the things that we did that was against God's will for our lives, all the things we said that was against God's will for our lives. I know I've done that before. And how about this one? All the things that we've thought that were against God's will for our lives. To the disciples, their leader, their their, their teacher, the one they loved, the one who they thought was going to be the Messiah to save them, had died. And they didn't get it. It was confusing to them. They didn't totally get what Jesus was saying until Jesus rose from the dead. Until he literally, physically, historically rose from the dead. It's not a myth, as the video said. Jesus actually rose from the dead. It's a historical event. It was then that they realized that the cross wasn't a tragedy, but it was a triumph that was validated by his Resurrection. The resurrection proved that the check cleared, that, that Jesus' payment was accepted by God, that sin, death, and suffering had been overcome. That's what it proved. Amen. I mean, why do you think we hang a cross so prominently? You go into most churches these days, most Christian churches, and you see a cross hanging prominently. Some of you may have one prominently hanging around your neck. Why do we do that? Not because it's a tragedy. Because it leads to joy, because it's a sign of victory, a sign of triumph. 
The transformation of the cross into the resurre- resurrection makes our joy inevitable. Right? The resurrection seals the deal for us. Well, this wasn't new news. 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah foretold that Jesus would go through the transformation from sorrow to joy for our sake. Isaiah 53.3. If you want to read something great, read all of Isaiah 53. But Isaiah 53.3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering. But the preacher of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 12.2, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Sorrow turned into joy. Jesus went to the cross for joy, for, out of joy himself and out of joy for you. And you can experience that same lasting joy if you know Jesus. See, Jesus is the only man to beat death, never to, to come alive again, right? People come alive for a little while, right? We can put the paddles on them, boom, they're back for a, for a little while, but, but they're going to die again. Jesus was the only one who ever died, never to die again, and he died death for you. And if you know Jesus, the grave has no hold on you. Right? Neither do people and things that you're clinging to, hoping to get joy out of them. They don't cling to you anymore either if you're trusting in Jesus. You see, the transforming joy of Jesus makes you into a new creation. Yes. Using the illustration of, of giving birth, Jesus says, not something I can identify with, by the way. <laughs> experienced it, but not experienced it, if you know what I mean. He says, John 16, 21, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish, right? How many women, like a year later, like, let's have another one, right? Yeah. Right, Jess? Yeah, <laughs> right? Because she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human has been born into the world, right? It's the joy that makes you forget the anguish. The disciples' sorrow over Jesus' death is going to explode into joy at his resurrection because of the joy it brings. It means that those things and people who turned, we turn to for joy, but who inevitably let us down, no longer have sway over our joy. Do you realize that? All the things before Jesus that you look to, to provide joy, they were gone, right? All of a sudden your joy is gone. Not so with Jesus, because he's been resurrected forever. He's our joy anchor. We've been born into a new life, into eternal life. If we know Jesus, we have the joy of a resurrection like his, the Apostle Paul said. He said, Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we certainly will be united with him in a resurrection like him. If you know Jesus when you die, you're going to end up yourself with a real, physically, bodily resurrection when that day comes, just as Jesus did. And also, when we know Jesus, we're transferred from the kingdom of this world and we become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. If you know Jesus right now, you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Which means we died to those things and people of this world that we thought would give us joy, but didn't. You know why they didn't? Because they couldn't. We've been given a new life of joy in Jesus even when we're suffering physically. We've been given a new life of joy in Jesus even when we're suffering emotionally. Our new joy in Jesus overcomes suffering. You see, hope and security is in Jesus. It's not in dead ends to joy that can never fully deliver. Jesus gives us joy even in our suffering. Right? Unless you know Jesus, you don't know that. He gives us joy in our suffering. And with our own resurrection one day, we are going to escape all suffering. That's the hope of heaven. Suffering is defeated through the cross and the resurrection. You see, the Christians, for all of us, really, as Kent told us this morning, death is just a mode of transportation. It brings us out of the suffering of this world as Christians and into a world where there is no more suffering. Eternal life through Jesus ultimately brings us to a place where our lowly bodies are transformed into resurrection bodies in a new heaven and earth where Revelation 21.4, Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. A lot of joy in that. 
The second aspect to resurrection joy Jesus shows us is that it is an enduring joy. It's an enduring joy. Jesus said, verse 22, your hearts will rejoice. And he says, and no one will take your joy. Jesus says that, you better believe it. Jesus shared this hope with them, not only because the cross was hours away, but because he knew that their lives are going to be filled with difficulty, suffering, opposition. He warned them of this at both ends of the chapter. Their joy in Jesus isn't going to be dependent on their circumstances. Christian, your joy in Jesus is not dependent on your circumstances or how popular you are. Their joy, Jesus said, will never run out. Our joy will never run out in Jesus. That's because Jesus has risen. That's because Jesus has not only risen, but Jesus reigns from heaven through those who have their joy in him. And because Jesus has risen and is reigning on earth as he is in heaven, he can guarantee that your joy will never run out. Ever. Every generation of believers right, in Christ has heard this, has, has spoken of the sweetness of joy they've had in Jesus, especially in the midst of suffering. How many times during prayer time have we heard people testify to the joy that they have in the most agonizing of things? Amen. It seems ironic, but it's true. Many in this room have suffered all sorts of difficulty and pain, and yet have found joy in Christ magnified, not diminished in their suffering. And it's in that very joy and suffering seen in all of you, seen in all of us as we've suffered that attracts people who don't know Jesus to Jesus. How many times do we know that's true? Like who can suffer with a smile on their face apart from those who know Jesus? Kent Hughes, who's a pastor and a commentator, said, the joy the world gives us is at the mercy of the world. The joy the world gives us is at the mercy of the world. But the joy which Christ gives us, he said, is independent of anything the world can do. The joy Jesus offers is so lasting that no amount of opposition can extinguish your joy in Jesus. All right, the third aspect to resurrection joy Jesus shows us is that it's an abiding joy. It's an abiding joy. Jesus said, people always ask about this voice, ready? This verse, verse 23 and 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive it that your joy may be full. Well, kind of sounds like a blank check there from Jesus, doesn't it, right? <laughs> it's right up the check today. Let's all start praying for all those things. Who knows what the parking lot will be filled with, right? <laughs> but it is kind of like that. Not that Jesus is your genie, but it is kind of like that. He's given us kind of a blank check. Not that the parking lot's going to be full. Don't, don't miss going. But he's given us a blank check for joy in our prayers, in a sense. We're, today we're only looking at nine verses. This is a discourse that like, spans two chapters, chapters 15 and 16. It's a discourse on joy, as a matter of fact, by Jesus. And Jesus begins the discourse by telling his disciples that when he's resurrected and they get new resurrection life in him, it will be like... He's the, the vine, and they're the branches. Okay? He's the vine, and they're the, the branches that are part of the vine. Jesus is telling them that's what this is going to be like. And he tells them if, if, if the branch isn't connected to its vine, well, it's not going to bear any fruit. Right? If, you're, if you say you're a believer in Christ, but you're not really connected to Jesus, you're not abiding in Jesus, you're not going to bear any fruit, he's saying. But if you're connected to the vine... Jesus says, you are going to begin bearing fruit. You're going to be fruitful. And Jesus explains that those who are connected to him through resurrection life are going to be fruit bearers. As they lean into the reality of the resurrection, as they lean into their own position in Christ, abiding in Jesus, as they abide in the risen Jesus, as they find their identity in Jesus, as they find their meaning in Jesus and what he's done and what he's overcome. That's what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about abiding. It's living for Jesus. It's living like someone who's a vine, uh, like a branch connected to a vine. And Jesus says in John 15 at the beginning of this discourse, these things I have spoken to you that your joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. 
Jesus is saying, abide in me. Find your identity in me. Find your purpose in me. Live for me and your joy will be full. Right? He's saying, your joy tank isn't going to be empty. It's not going to be quarter full. It's not going to be half full. Your joy will be full abiding in me. Have you ever tried abiding in money before? I have. Try abiding in money, right? You'll never have enough. It can't buy happiness. If you're abiding in your looks and appearance, guess what? We all get old. <laughs> right? We freak out over acne, right? If you're abiding in your kids or if you're abiding in your spouse or if you're abiding in your significant other and another person to fill your joy, guess what that's going to do? It's going to crush that person as you've tried to make them your joy filler. Only abiding in Jesus will your joy be full. All right, back to the blank check prayer of Jesus for joy and happiness. It's simple. Back to today's, to today's text, he says, verse 23. Let's read it again. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask my Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. What he's doing is he's circling back to verse 7 of the discourse. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Right? He's telling us what he means by that. <coughs> he's saying abide in me and your joy will be full and if you pray to God to my father abiding in Jesus he will give you the fuel that is going to fill your tank of joy pray for the things that someone living for Jesus gets joy from and he'll give it to you he'll give you what you need to find your identity and purpose in Jesus he'll give you what you need to live for Jesus and he will make your joy full Jesus promises to answer every fruit-bearing prayer that you lift up. Oh, Heavenly Father, grow me in love. Oh, Heavenly Father, grow me in joy. Oh, Heavenly Father, grow me in peace. Father, grow me in patience. Father, grow me in kindness. Father, grow me in gentleness. Father, grow me, grow me in, in self-control and goodness. Father, help me to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Father, help me to love my neighbor as myself. Those are fruit-bearing prayers that God will answer to fill your joy tank. Because what makes Jesus happy makes us happy when we're abiding in the resurrection power of Jesus. Sounds amazing, right? Better than any infomercial you've heard late at night. This is amazing. Some of you are probably asking, how do I get that? How does Jesus say we can have accessible joy? When Jesus died on the cross, his disciples weeped. His disciples lamented. But what did Jesus say the rest of the world was going to do while they were weeping and lamenting over his crucifixion in that hour? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will reap, weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. The world, those who, who, who don't have a right relationship with Jesus, they were happy. They rejoiced when he was out of the way. And it really is no different today. People love to see Jesus get out of the way. The cross and the resurrection is something known as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, gospel literally means good news. It's a word we see in the New Testament a lot of times. But that gospel, that good news of Christianity, the good news we have in what Jesus has done is offensive to those who aren't trusting in Jesus. The Apostle Paul said it, 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And in Galatians 5.11, he says, the gospel is a, an offense. It's an offense. It's offensive to people who don't accept it. Why don't they accept it? Why don't people accept the good news about Jesus Christ, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you said to me, I don't believe it because I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, I'd say you were very misinformed. Let's go look at historical, docu historical documents. We can have that discussion because I am very confident Jesus physically, historically rose from the dead. The evidence proves it. Not just because Wikipedia says it, but it does. 
Why is the gospel so offensive to those who don't believe? Why? I'll tell you why. Because they can't swallow their pride. It's because human beings don't like to be told they're not good enough. I never liked hearing that. Right? That they can't earn their way. Like they can never be good enough for God to get in. Right? Somehow we think we all deserve it. Right? It's just those really bad people over there. But 99.9% of people deserve it. But the fact is, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's right. How many are all? All. all. And Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. To be a Christian, you've got to swallow your pride. If you're a Christian, you've got to swallow your pride. You've got no boasting in you. You've got to admit that you need Jesus to do what you couldn't do for yourself. He had to pay for your sins so that you could be made right with God. And he rose from the dead proving that he'd done it. And that's what brings you to this enduring, transforming, abiding joy. A joy that will always be full. Forever. Now some people say, I can't believe in Christianity because it's too exclusive. Right? It says that... that, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And I'm pretty sure, Pastor, I just heard you say that. Well, that's true and it's not true. It's right and it's not right. Yes, Jesus is the only way to heaven. But just saying that that's exclusive is not true. It's inc Jesus is incredibly inclusive. Jesus is accessible to all who are willing to swallow their pride and trust in him. Do you want to know who keeps you from accessing fullness of joy? Any idea? You, right? It's only pride that keeps you and me from accessing joy in Jesus. Jesus says, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you just want to be happy, then you just need Jesus. That doesn't mean suffering's over. That doesn't mean trials are going to stop. But it does mean we can experience them with joy, with rejoicing. Because Christian joy is like that if we know Jesus. Sorrow and joy can coexist in Christ. In fact, as people of the resurrection, our joy shines brighter, as I said before, when things get darker. It's just like the stars at night. Right? If we're sitting here in the middle of Manchester near the airport, all these lights are gone. Right? We're over at the, the mall of New Hampshire and the lights are on. Can you see the stars? But you head out in the country where it's dark on a clear night, right? Darkness makes the light shine brighter. The 19th century preacher from London, Charles Spurgeon, said, Jesus doesn't merely put joy in reach. He puts it in your hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us new resurrection life in Jesus Life that leads to overflow and joy. So much that it infects the world around us. Show us those places where we're being robbed of joy by piling on false saviors on top of Jesus. God, work in us that which that we could never do on our own. Humble us so that we might rejoice in all circumstances. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.